Uh, I'm Amber Heard, uh, and I am here today to speak for a second, um, not as an actress, um, not as uh, the actress you may have never heard of, <laughs> but um, as the human, as the person who's aware, slightly awake, slightly, but motivated greatly. I guess it started very early for me. I grew up on the border, um, the US-Mexican border in Texas, where I saw my dad work, um, you know, he did uh, manual labor alongside uh, a labor force m comprised almost entirely of um, immigrants, migrants. And uh, we had a lot of, you know, uh, of these migrants living with us. I considered them friends and family. Um, I grew up on my dad's construction sites, bonding with them. You can imagine how bummed I was when I learned I didn't necessarily get entitled to a quinceanera. It was very disappointing. <laughs> Um, but I considered these people my friends and family, and we would take trips across the border often through my childhood. I think in my first interaction or my first uh, recollection of uh, the impact of injustice, unfairness, uh, it hit me on those trips um, when I could drive across the border and on the return trip back uh, north across the border, uh, it would land on me that I, by the accidental geography of my birth, could make that trip in both directions. And that why I, born by some accident, some fate, a few miles north of this line, um, soon to be a fence, <laughs> um, why I had this privilege, my counterparts living a few miles south didn't have that privilege. And uh, it struck me as inherently unfair. And I think even kids, uh, especially kids, have a finely tuned sense of justice, uh, finely tuned sense of what's fair. And something just didn't seem fair to me. Uh, so later, I moved to Los Angeles, I started working, but the indelible mark left on me by those experiences and the experiences I accru accrued over a lifetime of that um, drove me to start working. Uh, you know, I started going to the border on research missions with the ACLU. I worked in children's hospitals, um, specifically ones that I could translate at, and I later started taking trips to refugee camps uh, through various nonprofits. And now, with my work with the ACLU um, and the United Nations, I uh, have found myself in a position where um, I am speaking on behalf of others who might not necessarily have that voice. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's important um, because I you know simply put if anyone's human rights are denied everyone's human rights are undermined and it's something I couldn't forget but uh, you know I'm scared now to be quite honest I am um, a white woman uh, I live in the 21st century I live in the United States so. I already you know, won the lottery in so many ways, but I'm scared. I'm scared as I see increasingly polarized, uh, nationalistic and popularist uh, rhetoric flourishing. I see families separated, uh, human rights abuses uh, play out on the national stage without apology. Uh, or accountability or retribution. I see children in cages. I see uh, people elected to positions of power um, that uh, blatantly deny and disregard uh, the basic human rights of women, positions uh, uh, where they are less powerful. I watch them get elected. I watch the tone of the rhetoric change and increasingly um, uh, strong attitudes, whether they are in checkpoints or in the form of uh, of these, um, you know, Supreme Court uh, uh, nominees. I see uh, a lot of reasons why I should be scared. But 
there's hope. And what I'm seeing along with this is, I think, far more powerful. I'm seeing a groundswell of energy, of excitement, enthusiasm that has left a generation uh, like mine used to a certain amount of luxury and expectation for that luxury have left us somewhat apathetic uh, and disengaged and I have seen that all turn around lately or especially lately as I see a grassroots groundswell um, of, of galvanization people uh, like um, this you know amazing young activist I met recently called Amanda Wynn who uh, took an incredible tragedy uh, that befell her and turned it into ammunition. And uh, she was one of the individuals with whom I worked to um, gather more support through just grassroots efforts and this galvanization that I'm speaking of. And we capitalized off of this energy and uh, we walked into the Senate buildings hand in hand with survivors from the constituencies that were relevant and we confronted the senators ourselves. We organized protests. We uh, mounted, uh, in my opinion, a successful uh, campaign to push the narrative, to challenge the status quo and to say that we're here, our voices will be heard, and change like revolution does not happen overnight. Protests um, and revolution share this in common. Their, their uh, result is not in a vote or a law, it is in a change of attitude, and we are seeing that happen. So, uh, to leave you on a slightly more positive note, I think it is a great time for us I think everybody here, if you believe in human rights, you are a human rights activist. Change starts at home. If you believe in this, stand up. Be the leader that you are looking for. Now's the time. Thank you.